All right. Uh, uh, so it's a pleasure to welcome our speaker today. It's uh, John McKay from the University of Bristol, and he's going to tell us something about the conformal dimension and decomposition of hyperbolic groups. John, please. Thank you very much, Ilya. It's a pleasure to, to give the talk here. And uh, this is what I'll be talking about is joint work with Matthias Carrasco. It's nine o'clock on a Friday night here, so it'll perhaps be an even more relaxed talk than you're used to. I noticed from your, your previous seminars that there's quite a, a, a range of topics covered. So I'll try and keep this relatively gentle. Do jump in if you've got anything you want to ask about or if you want more details. Otherwise, I'll err on the side of giving you the, the big picture. The motivating question for what I'm talking about today is this question of Bonk and Kleiner. from about 15 years ago, which asked, so they asked, uh, which, uh, which group of hyperbolic groups have conformal, dim conformal dimension one okay so we've really got a few different things on the go in the title of this question we've got conformal dimension uh, which is an analytic invariant of metric spaces we've got grow of hyperbolic groups which i'm sure um, most if not all of you know but i'll give a quick recap anyway and we also have decompositions of hyperbolic groups which comes into the answer to this question I guess we've also got the number one, which seems like a it's a good number. Well, we'll see. Motivated by this, this is a, an interesting question to to study, hopefully, and the answer we're able to to get to um, Matthias and myself. Okay, so first, what do we need to know about chrome hyperbolic groups? as I'm sure uh, most of you know. So a metric space is delta hyperbolic if it's geodesic and all its triangles, geodesic triangles are delta thin. Nearly a terrible sin against grammar there. So as you know, or may well know, so I'll just draw a picture of a hyperbolic plane, which is a, as good an example as any. And if you've got a hyperbolic triangle, the gauss bonnet theorem tells you that if you're on one of the sides, then your distance to one of the other two sides is going to be at most delta. Another natural example of this would be a tree. So in a tree, the, each side is contained in the union of the other two sides. And much like the hyperbolic plane, what you have is the boundary infinity. So this goes back to studying Kleinian groups. So you've got geodesic rays going off to infinity, which uh, look like they're going off in totally different directions here, but uh, perhaps more, uh, I'll abuse the drawing a bit. And really what's happening is there's the two rays are staying delta close for some time, then they're going apart as fast as they possibly can. And this 
distance that they stay close for is the Gromov product of the two directions with respect to our base points in the hyperbolic distance. And if you're doing this in, in um, Euclidean space, then the distance between these two points, A and B, the Euclidean distance is comparable to E to the minus this Gromov product. For general Gromov hyperbolic spaces, you might need to change the power from a minus one to a minus something else. So that's called a visual metric. So what we've done there is we've defined a boundary infinity. I'll write down something to make it look more, more formal. So for our delta hyperbolic space X, we have this boundary infinity X, which is geodesic rays gamma mapping interval zero infinity into X. Perhaps going if you want, you could specify a base point, doesn't matter, up to some equivalence relation. And you can define this, this distance here. And as we've already mentioned, for Euclidean space, you get the usual sphere at infinity for the Poincaré disk model. Uh, for the tree, what you'd get is a uh, bunch of different, uh, all, all your different directions, give you this totally disconnected sets, which is homeomorphic to the usual counter set. Okay, uh, I'm supposed to be doing groups. What we've just done there is go with hyperbolic spaces, a couple of examples, and uh, go with hyperbolic groups are those, finally generated groups which act geometrically on a gram of hyperbolic space. So onwards, I'll write that down. So acting geometrically, I mean asymmetrically, properly, discontinuously, co-compactly. And to make sure everything's finally generated on a proper, so all balls, all closed balls are compact in a proper delta hyperbolic space. And we set its boundary infinity of the group to be the boundary infinity of this space. And that's already begging a few questions, which will be important in a moment, but uh, examples. So free groups acting geometrically in their kilograms, which with the usual generating set are trees. Um, closed hyperbolic manifolds or even hyperbolic manifolds with a totally geodesic boundary will act um, on hyper, usual hyperbolic space, or more generally, if you've got a fundamental group of a manifold which is closed with curvature that's negative, that'd be fine too. Uh, more algebraic examples, so many models of random groups will typically give you 
um, core of hyperbolic groups. Uh, another of the classical motivations besides fundamental groups of negatively curved manifolds would be small cancellation groups like C prime one six. Finally presented C prime one six groups, et cetera, et cetera. So lots of examples of chromo hyperbolic groups. Okay, uh, so that's chromo hyperbolic groups. What about conformal dimension? Um, well, let's think about this invariant that we, we cooked up in passing there called the, the boundary at infinity. I said it had this metric structure. I was a bit fast and loose there. Nobody seemed to mind. I wrote down, wrote down this symbol here, which just means agrees up to a multiplicative factor. So that's a choice. I also wrote down um, This is a bit psychedelic. I hope it's not too uh, annoying for people. I also wrote down this epsilon, which is another choice. What happens if you change this epsilon? Things get really pretty different. So as a remark, say we take the usual circle there, I said, if you put epsilon equals one, you get the circle. If you take the interval with the usual metric, raise it to the epsilon, well, what happens? So if, if uh, epsilon is one, you get the interval, so that's fine. If epsilon is bigger than one, uh, it's not a metric space anymore. You break the triangle inequality. And that's true if you have any geodesic metric space with a more than one point. If epsilon is less than one, that's okay. What you've done is you've turned your metric space into something that looks like a snowflake. And the dimension of this thing, whatever dimension means, Hausdorff dimension say, will be one over epsilon times what it was before. So these different choices of epsilon, there's one perfect choice there that made it an interval, but if you made epsilon too small, then what you get as a metric space is fractal looking in the sense of um, Hausdorff dimension is bigger than its topological dimension in this case. So that's one thing that can go wrong. The other thing that can go wrong is we have choices here, uh, I should have said proper, hyperbolic metric space X. Different X's will be quasi-isometric. Their boundaries won't be as simply related as this, but what they will be is something called quasi-symmetric. And that's a, it's a homeomorphism relationship. Uh, so the topology is canonical, but um, the metric is only canonical up to something called quasi-symmetry. So this is Pollen. And um, some the version for metric spaces is Bonkschram. So if you've got two uh, hyperbolic groups, then G is quasi isometric to H if and only if the boundary infinity of G with one of these choices of visual metrics and one of these spaces, for example, is uh, quasi-symmetric to um, the boundary infinity of H. I could define quasi-symmetry, but I'm not going to bother. Uh, it won't matter for, for the, the level of this talk. It just means that it's generalizations of, if you like, maps. The basic examples would be by Lipschitz maps, where you've got some multiplicative change of metric or taking powers. What do both of those maps do? They roughly preserve the shape of balls, not the size. A power could really do 
crazy things to the size of the ball, but it preserves the roundness of the ball. And that's what quasi-symmetric maps do. Okay, well, that's a theorem. Is there some content to it? Well, yes. There's more than just the topology to the boundary. So perhaps the classical example would be if you take complex hyperbolic space, say complex hyperbolic two-dimensional space, then the boundary infinity of this is homeomorphic to the three-sphere, but is not uh, the usual three-sphere. It's one modeled on the Heisenberg group, the so cardinal cartier joy metric. I, I see, um, see uh, experts in the audience. And indeed, uh, complex hyperbolic space is not, though they're both homeomorphic to R4, it's very much not quasi-isometric on the level of metrics. Um, so you wouldn't get the same group acting geometrically on both complex hyperbolic space, two space and hyperbolic four space. Okay, so what's the conformal dimension? Well, we've got these boundaries and we'd like to find some invariants that tell us something about them other than their topology. The topology is nice, but is there something more? For a metric space, one of the most natural things you can do is talk about the Hausdorff dimension to just mentioned here. But I've just also said that that doesn't make sense for a boundary of a hyperbolic group because you can always raise it to a power and that will make the dimension go up. However, you can't necessarily make it go down here we can go down past the topological dimension, for example. Um, and the smallest that we can get it to be is the conformal dimension. So this is a variation, well, it works out to the same thing. The original definition is due to Pansu. He was interested in these boundaries of rank one symmetric spaces, amongst other things. So I'll define it this way, so I don't have to define Hausdorff dimension. So the conformal dimension will take to be the smallest Q such that there exists a geometric action of G on a delta hyperbolic space X. And so that the boundary infinity of X has a Q regular metric. What is that? So this means that there's a measure on the boundary so that balls have measure um, that's the radius to the power Q. This measure could be, for example, Hausdorff Q-dimensional measure. But you know, if you've got Lebesgue measure in Rn, measure of a ball is proportional to R to the N. This is a nice kind of, um, th this means these boundaries are nice metric spaces where measures are like R to some power. This power doesn't have to be an integer though. Okay, so that's the definition. I should pause for any questions so far. Okay, I'll, I'll fire on. So this conformal dimension is the smallest dimension of, how, smallest Hausdorff-like dimension we can get on a boundary. Some examples. So if we do the, well, maybe easiest actually is this, the hyperbolic space. So we take our negatively curved surface. So that's going to be a topological circle. And we know that 
we can put a visual metric on it that's using Euclidean metric, which is one dimensional. It's a one regular metric. And these Hauser dimensions, these regular metrics can't go below the topological dimension, which is one. So this thing is one. Uh, another example would be if we do a free group. This one's less obvious. It's a Cantor set. Uh, these guys, you can in fact make the Hausdorff dimension go as low as you want. The power of epsilon that you pick, you can pick it to be bigger than one. There's, it's totally disconnected. So there's the triangle inequality doesn't break in the way it did for the interval. So you can make it this one over epsilon. You can make epsilon as big as you want, and you get this to go down as close as you want to zero. But it's not attained, and it follows from Stallings and Dunwoody that there's many equivalent ways of saying this. So if G is hyperbolic, then uh, the following are equivalents. So we could have the conformal dimension of G is zero, or the topological dimension of the, the boundary here should be clear of him. Whenever I'm talking about conformal dimension of G, I'm just meaning the boundary of G, just skipping it, which is the same thing as the boundary being totally disconnected, which is the same thing as G being virtually free. Okay. Going up a dimension before we come back to dimension one, which I said we we're interested in, and a big motivation for conformal dimension would come from this result of Bunk and Kleiner, which is one of a few that they had to do with rigidity properties related to Cannon's conjecture. So they said, if you have a G gomma of hyperbolic, with the boundary infinity homeomorphic, homeomorphic to the two sphere, then Cannon's conjecture says that's enough to know that G is going to be um, virtually Kleinian, co compact Kleinian group. So it's going to be a, like fundamental group of a hyperbolic three manifold, for example. Uh, they said if you add one extra condition, then this is true, which is that the conformal dimension is attained. So this is quite a strong hypothesis, I suppose. There's no particular reason that you'd expect a conformal dimension of the boundary to be attained. You've got all these different metrics. Why should there be a, why should your infimum be a minimum? But if it is, the fact that you're at this minimum allows you to, to get strong conclusions like this one for, for two sphere boundaries. Okay, that's two. What about, what other options are there out there for conformal dimension? I should say here, topological dimension zero being virtually free, being conformal dimension zero, means we could have replaced this by the conformal dimension, or we could have added another one, the conformal dimension of G. Now I can't remember whether I'm using G or less than, or the boundary of G, being less than one. So if the conformal dimension is less than one, that means the topological dimension is zero, so you're still in this world. So there's nothing between zero and one. So in a sense, one is the next interesting case after zero. What can we say about when the conformal dimension of, uh, sorry, what groups have conformal dimension one? Can we characterize it? Which ones attain conformal dimension one? That's the, the question that they had, that I said at the start of the, start of the talk. 
just to give you a big picture, there's lots of groups out there um, that have, so the, the values of conformal dimension for hyperbolic groups takes a dense set of values between one and infinity. Um, <clears throat> there's only countably many finely, ge finely generated hyperbolic groups. So there's only countably many possible conformal dimensions out there. So we aren't going to get all values between one infinity for groups, although you could for metric spaces. But there are examples like these, so that anything is possible. Um, you can get as close as you want to any, any value out there. Okay, before I go on to the, the next thing, are there any uh, uh, questions? Uh, so in this Bourdon building uh, examples, I forgot uh, topologically the Menge curves, right? Yes. So in fact, these are examples where the boundaries are all topological dimension one. And uh, yet the conformal dimension could be ar arbitrarily high. Elias speaking has reminded me a great place to learn about boundaries of hyperbolic groups is the survey he wrote with um, Bedeckley. So I'm glad he, he spoke up there. Okay, conformal dimension one then. What can we, we say about that? Let's do some examples. Elias just mentioned mega sponge boundaries. Maybe while we're at it, let's not let's do it here. Um, so the Menger sponge is, uh, that means they're homeomorphic to this classical fractal, the Menger sponge, which is what you get by taking a cube, drilling out the middle, uh, dividing each face into nine squares and drilling out the, the middle all the way through, and then repeating further down. So you're starting with something that's three-dimensional, but when you drill all these things out, you get uh, something that's topological dimension one. Interestingly, this is this is kind of universal topological dimension one space. And for reasons related to that, that's typically what you get in random groups as well. But uh, different metric structures are possible as Bruno buildings give examples of this. Okay, um, I haven't really talked about decompositions yet. So let's, we'll see how these come up in some more examples. So just to recap, we've got Gorm hyperbolic groups. We're interested in what kind of things can turn up with conformal dimension one and uh, can we characterize it? Well, okay, here's our first example. So if we let G be, um, a free product, say, we've already had free products. I guess F2 is a free product of Z with itself, D with itself. Topologically, that's like taking the fundamental group of these two spaces where we just join them at a point. So when we take the universal cover of this, we're going to get a bunch of hyperbolic planes connected at points.
So hyperbolic plane, it's, it's another hyperbolic plane, other hyperbolic planes. This hyperbolic plane is connected to other hyperbolic planes. And if we take the boundary infinity, they just draw the boundary, then what you'll get is this, these different um, circles at infinity. And those circles will have circles going around them. There'll be smaller circles as well near the first one. And these will limit onto this dust that's coming from the, the limits of the Basser tree as you, um, as you, you go out in this um, tree of spaces. And this is general. What you have is that the boundary being disconnected is corresponding to the group splitting over a finite subgroup. And there's a sort of, I don't really know who to attribute it to. It did appear in Matisse's thesis, but it's sort of known in the field before, I think. Um, which is, if you are interested in the an anal analytic side of this, then the conformal dimension is going to be the minimum of the conformal dimension of the factors. So if you have an infinite hyperbolic group, So that I don't have an empty boundary to worry about. And you've a, G has a graph of groups decomposition, which I'm thinking I probably don't need to define, but it just means it's made up of a bunch of groups joined up in that this kind of way. Here I joined them up over a trivial group, but you can join them up over finite groups. So allow finite joinings. The vertex groups will also be hyperbolic. Then the conformal dimension of the whole thing is the minimum, sorry, maximum of the conformal dimensions of the vertex groups. Okay, so this example up here is a space that has conformal dimension one and the boundary isn't a circle, it's a bunch of circles, okay. Uh, let's do another example. This one's due to Pansu. So you might say, well, all right, let's assume that things are connected. So Pansu is an example showing that things can still get a little bit odd. If we start with our same two surfaces here, And so we've got two of them. And we glue them along a simple closed curve. So it's, we take two simple closed curves. Say we've got two copies of the same simple closed curve there. And we glue in a, an annulus here, one end into each. So that's corresponding now to, to amalgamating over a cyclic subgroup.
then what do we get? So this time, the space is going to have a bunch of lifts of this green geodesic in it. And each time we have a lift, that's going to get glued into another copy of the hyperbolic plane. So there'll be another be gluing here. Where we've got this, um, the universal cover of the annulus there gluing the cross. But then there'll be more copies here that get glued on. Notice as well, when we've got these gluings, coming from these amalgamations over a cyclic subgroup. So what, well, what's the boundary? The boundary, we've got our circle here. And then where, where the um, cyclic subgroup has uh, endpoints is going to be another, um, another circle glued on, joining at those two points. So we're getting a bunch of circles glued at pairs of points. Now this thing is Hauser dimension bigger than one, but it has conformal dimension also equal to one. How can we see that? Well, there's a geometric way, which is in the, in the group here, I drew the hyperbolic metric, sorry, I drew the surface this way, but we could shrink the green curve by moving in particular space and get some long, thin picture like this, where our green curve is now tiny. And now, if you're wanting to go from one green curve to the next, you've got to go way out here and back again. And that means in the universal cover of this um, complex that you've built here. When you take the, the boundary at infinity, it's going to look like uh, the next step down circles are getting tinier and tinier compared to the, the picture I drew the first time. So there's still lots of them, but it's taking a long time to see the next, next branching. Another way of saying that is the volume growth of the space is getting closer and closer to the usual hyperbolic plane because the branching is taking longer and longer. Uh, it takes longer and longer to see more branches. So you still have conformal dimension one here. I can add the exclamation point without fear of mathematical notation breaking. So that's good. All right. Uh, oh, check, Ilya, remind me, it's still 10 to 5 to the hour? Uh, no, you have 60 minutes. I mean, in fact, maybe plus one minute. So you, you have until the hour, yeah. Oh, okay. thanks. I've, I've got to get to my bed at some point. <laughs> so I, won't go too I mean, long. you're allowed to finish early if you like. <laughs> Thanks. Um, okay, so that's a bit odder. Let's go the other way. What about bigger than one? Any questions while I'm clicking away randomly at this, this tablet? Okay, so How do you get something bigger than one? Well, you could have topological dimension too, but you know, that's, let's not worry about that. What about examples like this Menger sponge that we had before? The main way to get conformal dimension bigger than one basically comes down to this idea of, of Pansu. And the, I'll do it just by example. If you take the conformal dimension of a Cantor set across an interval, 
So how do we go draw this? So I'll draw a counter set here. Cross an interval. Then this is actually equal to the dimension of the counter set plus one. You can't make it any lower. So the counter set here is uh, log two over log three plus one. So morally, why might this not surprise you? Remember I said the counter set, you could snowflake it with epsilons as big as you want. So you could make the, you can rip it apart if you want. Whereas the interval, you couldn't do anything. Well, the thing about quasi-symmetric maps is they have to preserve the shape of balls. So anything you tried to do to the counter set direction, you'd also have to be doing to the line and you can't lower the, you can't lower the dimension of the lines. So that means you can't lower the dimension of the counter set either. That's not really a proof, but it perhaps convinces you why this might be plausible. I apologize to any uh, analytically minded people in the, the audience for that. Uh, so there's consequences of that. For example, the Sierpinski carpet or the Menger sponge. Um, so Sierpinski carpet would be the 2D version of the Menger sponge where you just delete the squares. That has a counter set cross interval inside it. So that's going to have conformal dimension bigger than log two over log three plus one, that's 1.63. People are still trying to work out what the conformal dimensions of the Sigmundsky carpet actually is. I think I was just seeing a talk related to that the other day. Um, Krepix, whose name I can't pronounce properly, at Mont uh, it's either Montana or Montana States. I think the record he's managed to get it to something around about 1.7 ish, which is it, it's it's very hard to compute this exactly this conformal dimension. Often you just wanted to do estimates. Um, it's taken so it's trying to work out what this is. People have been trying quite hard for twenty odd years. It's only now that it's starting to get quite quite good bounds. Um, this kind of phenomena happens in group case as well, though. So if we take, as you might guess from pictures of Kleinian groups. So if you take um, G to be the fundamental group of a hyperbolic three manifolds with totally geodesic boundary, then it's boundary infinity. It's going to be a subset of the two sphere and these Totally geodesic hyperbolic planes are cutting out circles in the boundary. So you cut out um, circles and lots of these circles all over the place. And this is homeomorphic to a Sierpinski carpet. And in particular, it's has it's connected, locally connected, has no local cut points. And the theorem of mine said that these spaces will have a counter set cross interval like thing inside them, which means that their conformal dimensions bigger than one. So it's connected. It's not a circle, so it's, we're not virtually Fuchsian. Those things are equivalent by um, Kabai, Kassin, Youngeris, and Tukia. And no local cut points. So by Bodich's JD steady composition for hyperbolic groups,
that's the same thing as there's no splitting. You can't write as an amalgamated product over virtually cyclic subgroups. Remember when we had the, the example where we amalgamated two surface groups over a cyclic subgroup, we got these pairs of cut points in the boundary. So Bodic showed that when you have these, if you have local cut points and you aren't this in this virtually fixing case, uh, then the um, they correspond, you can pair them up in a way that corresponds to splitting over a virtually cyclic subgroup. So something like this boundary here, then the conformal dimension is bigger than one, strictly bigger than one. There's some counter set like thing inside cross interval inside the boundary. Okay, we're almost able to state, state our results. Um, uh, yeah, why not I state it? I'll say the corollary first. So to answer our question, what, what can we say then about um, Group set of conformal dimension one boundaries. Well, I might state another one in a moment. So, <clears throat> so suppose G is hyperbolic and has no two torsion, or virtually no two torsion. And the following are equivalent. Um, first, that uh, the group has conformal dimension one. And second, that G has a hierarchical decomposition as graphs of groups over finite and virtually cyclic edge groups. Um, maybe I'll say it this way. G is built from, um, uh, sorry, and where the vertex groups at the end are either finite or um, virtually Fuchsian. So it's built from finite or virtually cyclic groups, you can split again if you wanted, and virtually Fuchsian groups. by repeatedly, by amalgamating over um, finite or virtually cyclic groups, so elementary subgroups. Finally, many times. So there's a sort of complete algebraic description of this analytic invariant. Uh, one of these directions is fairly immediate. Um, so if you, if you suppose you can formal dimension one, then you have to be of this form by an accessibility result of louder and token. So they say that if you have a hyperbolic group without two torsion, then if you do the following process, well, if more, but in particular, if you do the stallings dunwoody splitting of the group, so you split over finite subgroups as much as you can. You know you can do that sort of all at one go. So now you have a bunch of vertex groups, each of which has connected boundary. Then for each of those, you do Bowditch's JSJ decomposition, if you can. And for each of the new vertex groups, you do 
um, Stallings and Woody again if they're no longer connected boundary. And for each of those, you do uh, Bodish's J state composition and so on. They say, if you, Louder and Two can say, if you do this, then you're going to stop with finitely many steps. You're going to have finitely many vertex groups floating out there. Now, each of those vertex groups, because we're splitting over finite virtually cyclic subgroups, is going to be a quasi convex subgroup of the whole thing. So they're all going to have conformal dimension at most one, well, one or zero, as we've discussed already. And what, so what could we be left with? Well, if we've got zero ones, we know we've got three groups we could split. So we've got virtually cyclic, or if you split again, if you want, you get finite vertex groups. Um, the other thing that could happen is Bodich's. Um, Bodich's thing could stop when you've got some surface groups. So you could have some virtually Fuchsian guys. But you're never going to get the local cut points, no local cut points option appearing because of this theorem before, which said if you did, that would have conformal dimension bigger than one. So by louder and token, what we've got here is we've got, if you have conformal dimension one, then you have such a decomposition. And what the content of our work um, finishing, finished last year is, is to do the converse, is to show that you can um, go the other way. If you start building these things up, you can uh, keep making the conformal dimension one. Now, it's not going to be attained typically. Because, in fact, there's a theorem of Bonk and Kleiner again. Uh, but before I think. So this is true in all dimensions, but in particular here, if you have that the boundary infinity of G attains conformal dimension one, then G is virtually Fuchsian. So this goes via showing that if it contains conformal dimension one, then it has to be a circle. And then you can apply Gabay Casanovas. And so what's the kind of thing to uh, have as a slogan for how our proof goes? Well, I'll do one last example, which is a kind of motivator. I should say, our, so our general theorem, I won't state it, write down theorem B, uh, is that it applies to say, if you amalgamate over virtually cyclic edge groups, then the conformal dimension is the max of the vertex groups. Here's an example for you to have a picture. There were some partial results before ours due to Keith and Kleiner and Carrasco, where, for example, they could deal with a picture here for instead of doubling over a simple closed curve, you double over a curve that stays in one part of the surface. But if you have a filling curve, so on a cyclic subgroup, so that the lifts all keep crossing each other in the universal cover. So in the universal cover, all these lifts are going to break it up into bounded pieces. Then this guy, the boundary infinity, We have our circles and we have our children's circles. Again, glued at pairs of points. So I can't fit it on the page, but these are only glued at pairs of points. The green circles don't touch each other. And then these have children. The red one has a next generation down. The green ones have their own children. There are no local cut points in this picture in the sense, well, okay, there are lots of local cut points, the circles and the cut pairs, but you cannot disconnect the red circle by deleting 
uh, green points because there's always a green detour. And the moral of our proof is to send, if you think of the red, green, blue as a geometric sequence of scales, we turn this into an arithmetic sequence of scales. And that has the effect of turning the boundary into something that probably looks a bit like this. So the green guys, the red guys, one big thing, and the green ones will be something like this. The blue ones, the ones near, say, a, a endpoint, if we think of it happening relative to here. And the blue ones will look like this. And then they get smaller out here. And they get big again here. And this kind of uh, shuffling mass around is something that you can formulate analytically, but it's a group theory seminar, so I, I won't do it. Modulus of curves, magic words like that. Anyhow, so what's the upshot of this? So we've managed to characterize um, the hyperbolic groups that have conformal dimension one. As a corollary of Bonk and Kleiner, we've characterized which ones attain it and which ones don't. And this corresponds to this algebraic splitting phenomena. Other things, there's still lots of open questions out there. Obviously, Ken's conjecture is one. Um, you could think about how can, perhaps when you split over larger subgroups, like three subgroups. Um, the general question of which groups attain their conformal dimension of their boundaries is an important one. Random groups, for example, Kasdan property T groups, do these attain their, their conformal dimensions, which would give rigidity properties for the, the corresponding groups. So thank you for your attention. I uh, hope you uh, got something out of that. All right. Thank you very much. Right. So if there are any questions for John, you're welcome to ask them. Uh, you said something about uh, random groups, about conformal dimension. Uh, so what is it? What is known about that? It's a, it's a good question. So uh, for the triangular model, uh, uh, growth triangular model, below density a third you're free, so zero above a half you're trivial, so it's well, undefined. Between a third and a half, the conformal dimension uh, grows, it goes to infinity as m goes, to, as the number of generators goes to infinity. Between three and model. between one third and a one half. One third and a half, yeah. This is not in triangular model, just in, in general model or in, tri in a triangular model. What I'm saying right now is specific for the triangular model. Uh -huh, I see, then, okay. So the, it goes to infinity at a rate comparable to log m. So myself and Cornelia drew to show that it, well, the upper bound of log m is, is fairly elementary. We got a lower bound going to infinity, like square root of log m over log log m. This is using spectral methods like fixed point properties for LP spaces. And mm -hmm. the, um, uh, the lower bound is improved first by Delat de la Salle and then by uh, Oppenheim, I think, for, very recently to get the, it's going linearly in log m. Mm -hmm. For the Gr Gromov density model, there's no there's no sharp number, but it's, you, you're at least getting the right same asymptotics above and below. For the Gromov density model, um, I've got a re result for for um, uh, if you've density d less than an eighth, then the conformal dimension grows to infinity, like. Uh, D over log D L. Mm -hmm. So, and that means you can sort of see the density if you throw in another parameter like the Euler characteristic, the density from the Euler characteristic and the, I think I'm not forgetting, I guess it could be log M. Uh, you can sort of see it at these low densities going to infinity at a linear rate in L, the length of the relators. Uh, 
-hmm. there's a PhD student from Bristol uh, in the audience, Jordan, who's, uh, well, yeah, the, going, going past an eighth um, is open at the moment, but maybe not for much longer. Uh -huh. okay, thank you. Uh, so I had several questions, but I wanted to ask, uh, um, uh, so, um, uh, you, I mean, is it easy to see, uh, you mentioned that uh, if the conformal dimension is, is equal to zero, then uh, the, uh, there are a bunch of equivalent things and in particular it implies that the group is virtually free. Uh, so is it easy to see, uh, why is that true? I mean, how does one get from there to... Uh, <laughs> um, so the conformal dimension is an upper bound for the topological dimension. Uh, yes. And so, um, Um, topological dimension zero. Uh, yeah, with topological dimension, I understand, but. Um... So you get from that that the um, the boundary is totally disconnected. Oh, I see. Uh, just a so second. when you do the stalling. Oh, 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 I I get it. Yeah, because topological dimension is an integer. Yes, uh, I see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I, I get it now. Uh, and the other question I had was uh, this other result uh, that you mentioned the um, that no local cut points. Uh, you know, with other assumptions, implies that uh, the conformal dimension is bigger than one. So can you say anything about where that comes from? Uh, you know. So... Yeah. So this is a sort of metric space result. Um, is is the underlying um, bound is coming from if you've got something that's like a Cantor set cross interval, uh, right. then then you get a number bigger than one. The way that I proved it is that so the boundary is very self similar, and if you've no local cut points, what you can do is you can start with you can start with the curve. If there are no local cut points, you can unzip this curve. So you start with some point nearby and join it up to the curve. Then this point isn't a local cut point. So that means there's some detour around it. And so from this, you can uh, push a little bit further along the curve having two separate ones. And then this new point isn't a local cut point. So you can push a little bit further here. And we now have and you can go all the way along to turn one curve into two curves that are kind of housed earth close to each other. Hmm. And then you can apply this process to the next two curves. So you get a red curve going into two, two orange curves going into four uh, green curves. If you do this just with the topological assumption of no local cut points, what you'll end up with is, is a topological uh, counter set cross interval but in order to get the metric thing you have to use self-similarity and a lot of compactness arguments to do this in a way that's kind of the same on every scale okay. so it's, it's not super long but it's i don't know 10 15 pages to try and um, yeah, I see. yeah basically that that was my thesis and this whole talk could be a kind of extended things i wish i'd finished in my thesis talk <laughs> <laughs> All right, very good. Okay, are there any other questions? Okay, let us thank John again. Thank you. Thanks. So I'll stop the recording. Uh, thank you. Thank you.